All right, so today we're going to, I'm going to talk about anesthesia for day care surgery and the experience we've had at Chavira Surgical Center. Uh, Chavira Surgical Center at the moment is, uh, is the, the only standalone day care surgical center that we are aware of. Um, so it's a non-profit daycare surgery center located in Budondo in, in Jinja district. If you know where the Bujagali Falls used to be, uh, the, if you go towards that direction, uh, you just follow the signpost, Shabira Surgical Center is easy to find. And that is um, a, an aerial view of the hospital. Uh, that, that view of you, you see of the river towards the end, uh, you cannot really see the river from the hospital, but when you get an area view, yes, the river is not so far from the hospital. And all that you see on top are solar panels because the hospital is designed to be in a self-sustaining way. So, so as that we're able to uh, need to have constant, reliable, power so the whole roof is covered with solar panels then there is a water harvesting system and right now this photo is uh, is a few months old because there's construction going on on the on the further end of the hospital to expand it with a bit more rooms offices and uh, so that's to increase the capacity of the hospital so daycare surgery uh, is also called ambulatory surgery and what it is really is basically having a patient discharged from the hospital on the same day of their surgery if uh, if you achieve if we do that then we consider that daycare surgery there are situations where maybe the patient spends a night in the hospital and is discharged the following day that falls under extended uh, recovery uh, so at Chavira Surgical Center, so far this year we've had 983 surgeries and almost 100% of them we've been able to discharge them home on the same day of the, of the surgery. And uh, it's just maybe four of those patients who required an overnight stay, but usually it's because they needed maybe longer observation or, the, or their surgeries happened so late in the day, like maybe the surgery happened at five or at six, such that uh, it is not safe to send the patient at night home. So you observe them overnight and then they are sent home the following day. So it is possible. And you will see later when I talk about the range of the surgeries that we do, that uh, a lot of the surgeries that go on in our hospitals can be done as daycare surgeries and it has really many advantages. So one of the advantages of daycare surgery is that one, it is cheaper to run. One, you do not have, you don't need to have hospital admission beds. You don't need to have admission rooms, overnight staff, uh, pay for water bills and electricity bills at night, uh, pay for the food of the staff for supper and the food for the patient. So on the side of the hospital uh, administration, it is cheaper to run, but it's also cheaper for the patient because the, the unit, total unit cost that you use that uh, in having a daycare operation is a lot less than what a patient who is going to spend two or three nights in a hospital uh, is going to, what that patient is going to spend because you will have to pay for the rooms, pay for, all the IV medication, pay for an extra nursing, nursing charge, all that. So it's generally a cheaper option uh, than the admission uh, kind of surgery. Then there's less risk of hospital acquired infections and we know these are usually difficult to treat. And there's a, an advantage of recovering in a familiar environment. It's psychologically better uh, for the patient and it promotes their, it makes them recover easier and in a less stress-free environment. And then the recovery is faster because we use enhanced recovery protocols. And with daycare surgery, you can have, you can operate on a lot more patients than if you have an admission facility. 
uh, because the admission facility is limited by the number of patients you can admit. But with daycare surgery, you can uh, you can operate on uh, patients way above your your admission facility if you use all the protocols that uh, that are involved in ensuring a successful daycare surgery. So why am I talking about daycare surgery? Why we're talking about anesthesia for daycare surgery? Because you really we have to mention uh, the surgery before we talk about the anesthesia for those surgeries. So what surgeries can be done as daycare? Here I've listed a few general examples, but think of any surgery, um, there is a way that it can be done as daycare. With advances in technology and drugs, many more surgeries are going to be done as daycare. Uh, I have a colleague in Australia who does uh, shoulder surgeries as daycare. They discharge the patient's home with a, a pump that, uh, uh, with a disposable pump that uh, he puts a local anesthetic throughout the shoulder so the patient is pain-free. And then there's also a home follow-up system. Think of any surgery. Uh, there may, it's possible with, with maneuvers here and there to, uh, to convert it into a daycare. Of course, some are more complicated than others, so it may be in a lot more years in future. But at the moment, most of the surgeries that we do in Uganda can be done as daycare, more than 70%. Um, the surgeries that we've done at Chari Ra include neurophys, aridectomies, mastectomies. We currently do laparoscopic surgeries. Those are the keyhole surgeries where you do, we can have a major abdominal surgery where you throw a small cut on the abdomen and the surgeon looks through a camera. Then we also have endoscopies, and we are privileged to have uh, a senior consultants for ENT, Dr. Fred Biso and Dr. Ubwa Michael, who also uh, run the ENT surgeries, and a lot, many, many more. So those are some of the examples of the uh, surgeries that, were, that we do. This uh, picture on the left is uh, that was doc that is Dr. Joseph Damoy, our head surgeon, who was doing a colonoscopy. Then this other picture on the top left uh, that's Dr. Joseph Damoy with our team. They were doing a, a laparoscopic cholecystectomy recently. So when we talk about anesthesia for daycare surgery, the goal is to 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 have the patient quickly return to normal feeding, normal movement, and full cognitive ability, as early as safely possible. Uh, basically, think of it this way. We want the patient who has walked into the hospital in the morning uh, for a surgery, we want them in, by the time uh, they're discharged in the evening, that they're able to walk back to the car that brought them and, and go home safely, pain-free, not nauseated, not dizzy, and that is really the goal in anesthesia for daycare surgery. How do we achieve this? We utilize enhanced recovery after surgery protocols. These are evidence-based uh, multidisciplinary protocols that are designed to enable a patient to recover early. Uh, they involve a number of things that involve uh, feeding, uh, psychosocial support. So there's a lot of uh, personnel involved from the anesthesiologist to the surgeon, to the nursing care, to the social worker, all those uh, play a hand in making sure that the patient is ready for the surgery, goes through the surgery safely and goes home safely and has a safe recovery period. So when, when our patients have been uh, confirmed that they need a surgery, uh, one, there are things that we check uh, and we must ensure before we can go ahead with having the surgery. One, every patient who comes for surgery must have a caretaker. It's one of, it's an essential component of, of uh, uh, enhanced recovery after surgery uh, and daycare surgery protocols. The presence of a caretaker uh, helps a lot. Um, they need that person who can make decisions for you in case you're not able to, or can bring the, the patient the food that they like, that they require, can uh, 
or we can communicate with in case uh, the patient may be still drowsy and we need to make a certain communication. Every patient must have a caretaker. Um, whether even when the surgery is something as routine as maybe an, an endoscopy, uh, usually we, we try to insist that the patient comes with someone. Um, then must have a working phone number. A lot of the, of the daycare anesthesia and surgery it involves a lot of phone follow-up, especially during the discharge area period. And then also we want to be aware where the patient is going to stay after surgery. Uh, the international guidelines of daycare anesthesia for, for surgery uh, usually recommend the patient not staying beyond uh, a place that is not further than one hour from the hospital. Uh, but as we bring it even closer, particularly for major surgeries like our thyroidectomy, the laparoscopies, most of these patients uh, don't stay further than 30 minutes from the hospital. When the surgery has been uh, confirmed and the patient has been booked on the list, a uh, phone call is made a week before the surgery date to confirm that the patient can and will come to the hospital. Why we do this, we want to, uh, to make sure we don't uh, allocate a slot for a surgery and then maybe the patient doesn't come, uh, come that day and that uh, slot gets wasted that could have been used for another person. So that's why the phone call a week before happens. Then the day before the surgery, make another phone call to the patient. This is really to guide on feeding, time of arrival, uh, ensuring that the caretaker will come. Um, I'll, cause we don't uh, encourage all patients to come at the same time because some there are some surgeries where we know we're going to do it in the afternoon. So we may encourage the patient to come. For example, if the surgery is at one o'clock, we may tell the patient, can you come at 10? If the surgery is at nine, we tell them come at at uh, at eight in the morning. So all those all those factors help a person to stay in a in a relaxed uh, calm state. So that, uh, for example, if a person goes to hospital and then they are due for a surgery, and from morning till evening they are waiting for the surgery that they are going to have, uh, it can be a bit uh, uh, destabilizing for the patient. But note that we have been 100% in this. Sometimes it's not possible to pull it off that a person only comes three or two hours to their surgery. So in the event where it's not possible, we try to communicate and do and try to adjust, for example, the fasting protocol so that the, uh, the patient is not too hungry or too uh, anxious by the time surgery has come. So then we do a pre-anesthetic assessment. The pre-anesthetic assessment is different from the surgical assessment. Here we are checking if a patient can undergo anesthesia for the surgery uh, safely. Um, whether it's something small like an excision of a lipoma or something major like a thyroidectomy, all patients must have a pre-anesthetic assessment. Um, so it's based on the American Society of Anesthesiology's physical classification, and it uh, ranges from one to six. The higher the number, the sicker the patient. So the fit and healthy patients, usually we see them on the day of surgery. We don't need to see them uh, days or weeks before because uh, the condition, this, this isn't a much to, there isn't much to change or to adjust. For the sicker patients uh, are the ones we choose to see days or weeks before their due date of surgery. Because sometimes there may be an extra test that we need, uh, an extra drug that the patient needs to be taking or to stop uh, in order for them to safely undergo anesthesia. So when we are ready with all the patients, we usually have a theater list. This is just a sample of a theater list from one of the days. Um, so we prioritize the children and the elderly first on the list. One, children are not able to fast that long, to be without food that long. And then the longer they wait, the more irritable they get and the more stormy their surgery experience becomes. Uh, there is a unwritten rule that me and some of my colleagues have that if you walk into a recovery room, a room where people have been operated and children are screaming left, right and center, 
something is not right, uh, something has not gone right. Ideally, a good recovery room, people are fully awake and they are calm and they're pain free and, and they are okay, even uh, the little children. So the major cases, usually those that require a long period of postoperative observation, we try to do them earlier during the day so that we have a longer period of observation. And for example, if we're doing, usually if we're doing like a, a thyroidectomy, we'll do it much earlier during the day so that we have a longer period of observations. And by the time we send a patient home much later in the evening, we are sure that we are out of uh, the out of the immediate complications that can happen. Uh, so the anesthetic techniques that we choose for these surgeries uh, one depend on the surgery, but there is a general preference for us to use regional or local anesthesia. Regional or local anesthesia is where we numb an area of the body and the patient does not sleep, stays awake. For example, the picture on the right, uh, in this uh, case, we were doing a mastectomy. Uh, we were removing a breast for that had cancer. And in this case, uh, this is a paravertebral block. As you can see, the markings T1, T2, T3, those are markings to guide where we are going to put the, the nerve blocks that would numb the whole of the breast on that side so that this patient can have pain control. Uh, but for these, here, would, would this particular mastectomy, we don't do them when the patients are awake because we still do uh, the second option where we combine general, with the third option where we combine general anesthesia and regional anesthesia. So that the patient is pain-free, but also they are not awake to experience the ordeal of the surgery. Um, in general anesthesia, we use really potent short-acting drugs why potential acting drugs? These get out of the body system much faster and uh, so that a person can be fully awake by like two or three hours after you're done with the surgery. And these include propofol, sevoflurane, fentanyl. Um, we try to avoid using uh, um, drugs that stay in the system really long because those don't work well with neck care surgery. And then you find that uh, the patient is still drowsy many uh, hours after the surgery or is not even able to walk and feed themselves. But remember the three goals that we, that we have in anesthesia for day care surgery. Patient is able to feed well, move well, and has full cognitive ability. Um, then we have the sedations which we use for, for the patients who are having like short, procedures like endoscopies, colonoscopies, uh, some uh, true cut biopsies, uh, which involve getting multiple samples. Many times patients are not able to tolerate those many pricks and so combine with some sedation. And um, those, we still use the short acting drugs, uh, such that the patient within 10, 15 minutes, person is awake. Then within like 30 minutes to one hour there, the patient is able to get up and move and, and still be able to get home normally by the end of the day, pain-free. Mm -hmm. So in, uh, in our preference for regional anesthesia, if you see the picture on the left lower there, I was doing uh, an ultrasound guided nerve block uh, for a patient who had an abdominal procedure that's really to, to make sure that the pain is well controlled and the patient doesn't wake up with pain. And then on the upper left, uh, you can see the mass. That mass may look small on the picture, but it was really big. They were targeting a specific uh, uh, nerves that supply that area uh, so that the surgery could go on without any, uh, without any pain. And then on the right, that was the setup for ultra, an ultrasound guided uh, nerve flow. So our feeding protocol in, de in anesthesia for day care surgery is also different. Um, there is a general uh, feed uh, fasting guideline that is we use in anesthesia, but in hospitals where patients are admitted, it's not strictly adhered to. So you find that the general rule in many hospitals is 
don't eat anything after midnight. Uh, so even when the surgery is at 11 a.m. the following day or 1 p.m. or 3 p.m., we'll still the patients are still told don't eat anything after midnight. Um, what that when that happens, you find when patients starve a lot, their recovery is also not as swift. So they recover when they are drowsy, dizzy, and when they get up, they are not able to hold themselves well. And that doesn't work well with the daycare surgery. Uh, you may ask why does why isn't it adhered to in other hospitals? Uh, maybe there is the safety net of the patient is going to sleep in hospital besides so the patient is going to stay on a bed. We're going to move them from a theater bed, a recovery bed, to a bed in the room. So uh, if they are drowsy or dizzy, let them just wait it out. But um, all these we try to adhere to the to the to the clear fluid on the day of surgery till two hours before procedure. One of the drinks we recommend patients to drink usually is sweet dry tea. Um, for those who may not understand what that means, it's uh, uh, hot water, tea leaves, and sugar. Um, so it's it's it helps patients uh, get. To the, to the surgery when they are not hungry, when they are not drowsy. Uh, a number of people get nauseated when they get hungry. So all these, uh, they, we adhere to this to make sure the patients are okay. And even after the surgery, you find that they are doing uh, much better than those who are starved for long. Uh, why it's not adhered to in, uh, in the hospitals where we admit patients, uh, like I mentioned, like I already mentioned, I think it's because of the safety net of the patient's going to be on a bed or to another bed or to another bed, we shall send them home tomorrow. And then we do early resumption of feeding after surgery. Uh, for any surgery where there's no absolute uh, contraindication, and there's no contraindication to the patient eating, we encourage the patient to eat as soon as they're fully awake. And one, because we use short acting drugs that will be out of the system quickly. So you'll find, for example, a patient we have worked on at eight, let's say we have done an inguinohania and uh, it was straightforward, no issues. At lunchtime, at, uh, we've worked on them at eight, at lunchtime, um, they are, they'll be able to move their legs and they'll be uh, having lunch. And then in the evening, if they want, they can have evening tea. So all those uh, enable patients to recover quickly and also keep them uh, comfortable. The one important aspect that's important in daycare surgery is multimodal analgesia. This involves using painkillers that work differently together, and it's more effective than using one type of painkiller. Uh, so for example, giving a person diclofenac alone and is, uh, you'd rather give them diclofenac combined with paracetamol because these work at different sites. If you look at the picture on the right, um, there is trauma down on the tissue and then the pain is sensed in the brain. Now, giving drugs that work differently, target the pathway of this pain at different points such that uh, if the pain that whichever pain that maybe escapes the work of this one is covered by the other. Whatever escapes the work of the other one is covered by the other. And some of the common combinations used at our hospital, we use etorecoxy, paracetamol, maybe plus a paravertebral nerve block if we have done um, mastectomy. And we found all our patients, who, uh, for example, all the patients of mastectomy that we've done uh, this combination, we find that on day one, they have no pain uh, using a visual analog score. Day one, no pain. Day two, no pain. Day three, uh, no pain. And uh, they are back to normal life early. One of the patients we worked on, for example, uh, we called her the following day for, to follow up how she was. And she was driving and were wondering uh, why she was driving on the following day to advise that to rest, but she was like, I don't have any pain, I am perfectly fine. Yeah. Another thing that we aggressively uh, prevent in daycare anesthesia, in, in anesthesia for daycare surgery is postoperative nausea and vomiting, but you can also include post discharge nausea and vomiting. So, vomiting has a whole pathway that is moves uh, that that 
from right from the brain right down to the stomach and we still use a multimodal approach we use drugs that act at different levels of that pathway to make sure that the patient does not get nauseated and does not vomit in right now to date we have um, our the number of surgeries we've done is about it almost comes to 2,500 since we started in, in September uh, at the end of 2019. So you could say more or less in maybe three years. Um, we, have, we have found, we have not had more than five patients having uh, nausea and vomiting in the recovery area because we aggressively uh, manage it. So for an example of a combination that we give, we give metoclopramide, dexamethasone, and ondacetron. Uh, once you manage a uh, nausea and vomiting uh, and the patient is comfortable and feeling it uh, works really well. Nose, uh, patients who are nauseous in the post period, it's a bit expensive for the hospital and also yeah, not that comfortable for the patient. So that's why we target it at all those different points and our patients have been uh, fine. So the discharge protocol, um, many times people worry that oh, if I send this patient home, is it safe? So they are, they are, they are discharged. There's a discharge protocol that we use. There's what we call the PAD system, which is the post anesthesia discharge scoring system. Now there's the, you can modify it for your hospital. So ours, we've modified it to be really strict such that by the time we send a patient home we are sure that uh, they are perfectly fine so it covers things like vital signs ambulation or stop nausea vomiting the pain the patient is feeling monitor surgical bleeding monitors urination urination is very important especially in the patients we give spinal anesthetics because one of the complications that patients get is the uh, urinary retention so we 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 organize it in such a way that by the time the patient uh, is going home, um, demonstrated uh, no more micturition, no more urination. Then, whenever possible, we want the patient to demonstrate that they have been they are able to drink and eat because we're sending them home. And so, if they can't drink and eat, then they need to be in the hospital. Then, uh, the location of the home. Uh, which will have been confirmed preoperatively. We don't want uh, the home, particularly for major surgeries, particularly for major surgeries, we don't want the home to be more than 30 minutes to one hour away from the hospital. So there have been situations where maybe a patient comes from, let's say, Tororo uh, or Mbale. There have been situations where we've had to, uh, where a patient has had to find a place near the hospital and have uh, because it's also an NGO, sometimes we'll, there's patients who we have found four places to stay that are near the hospital so that we can easily follow them up after their major surgeries. And then there must be the presence of a caretaker and then the phone contacts, uh, which I've already mentioned. There are situations where maybe the patients are so poor that the phone, that they have no reliable phone contact. And we use maybe the contact of the next of kin or a neighbor um, then many times we want to know the mode of transport the patient is using when returning home. Again, this depends on the kind of surgery the patient has had. Uh, for example, a patient who has had a small swelling on the wrist removed uh, under local anesthesia, uh, if they're going to, uh, is, is going to require a different kind of transport from the patient who has who has had maybe a laparoscopic cholecystectomy, uh, one may use a border, one wouldn't carry to use a border. Then we give maybe, uh, we rather we give uh, medication and feeding instructions in the, in, the, in, in the recovery area. And then we make sure the patients have the contact of the field nurse uh, who who sees, who makes sure it follows them up in the, uh, gets their contacts and knows where their homes are uh, from the recovery area and follows them up uh, postoperatively. So for ex this picture is an example of uh, towards the end of the day. Uh, that you see there is our head surgeon, Dr. Joseph, discussing with the patient their results. Then you can see in the back, there's a patient having food and Coca-Cola who has just had uh, their surgery. 
Then this is again, Dr. Joseph explaining results to one of the patients. So this, this is uh, a, a general, this is a, usually the typical setting uh, towards the time of discharge. Uh, we don't have one time of discharge. Sometimes patients, uh, there are cases where a patient doesn't have to wait for all these explanations and words uh, before going home. So um, the more we are able to, to work on uh, a patient and them able to go home early, the more patients we are able to work on. And But still, we do it in a way that is safe for the patient. So it's not like uh, you tell the patient, get up and go. No, it's always maintain what? Um, uh, medical ethics and make sure that it's safe for the patient to to go uh, to to be discharged. For example, if a patient has had a small lipoma removed, maybe on the leg, uh, under local anesthesia, uh, that will require different discharge instructions from the one maybe who needs. Uh, for example, this patient I think had an endoscopy and needed explain explanation for what the what was seen in the in the endoscopy. So a key component of decay anesthesia is home follow-up um, because uh, there's nothing 100% in medicine. So if you send a patient home, you should still be able, uh, the hospital should still be reachable. So we have a hospital contact that is reachable for follow-up 24-7. And all our patients who, who we discharge home uh, have this contact. And then the patient is called on postoperative days one and three. That's usually the following day and then the, uh, the, on the third day. Depending on what uh, this call uh, finds, that patient may be visited, but the patient who will definitely require a visit um, at, at their home, still depending on the type of surgery and the findings on the follow-up phone call. For example, if we've done a thyroid patient, a laparoscopic patient, Usually those patients will be visited at home, the major surgery patients or the hernia patients. Uh, but if a person has had maybe an endoscopy that was normal, routine, a phone call 24 hours after the, on the day after the, uh, the procedure is really enough. You don't need to do the visit. Then the patients are usually given a, 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 a day to return to the hospital for review between days five and seven. And then depending on what is found during those days, a, full, a further review uh, date can be set or that can, or that or the patient can be, um, can just continue with their recovery at home without need to come to the hospital. So this is, for example, uh, our field nurse who had gone to do a uh, a uh, home follow-up for one of the patients. So uh, these are our contacts at Shavira. Feel free to contact us, or send us an email or check out our website. And I will welcome any questions now. Thank you for listening to me.